with no further ado, I will welcome up Swix and Josh to the stage. All right, Swix, you're perfect. Take the shirts I brought were over there. Oh, yes. Yes. All right. So um, today, for those of you who have been here before, you know the general format. So we'll do a quick fireside Q&A with Swix, where we're asking him the questions. Then we'll actually go to our rapid fire Q&A, where we're asking really fast, hopefully hot, spicy questions. Um, and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, for your questions. So you guys see hopefully all the QR codes around the room. Submit your questions, and we'll go through as many of them as possible during that period. And then actually, Swix brought a, a gift for us, which is two Latent Space t-shirts. AI engineer. AI engineer t-shirts. <laughs> um, and those will be awarded to the two spiciest question <laughs> askers. So, uh, and I'll let Josh decide on that. So we want to get your <laughs> spiciest takes. Please send them in during the event as we're talking and then also at the end. Um, all right, with cool. that, let's get going. Let's go. Okay. Welcome, Swix. <laughs> Thank you for that intro. Thanks. How does it for feel to be interviewed rather than the interviewer? Uh, weird. I weird. don't know what to do in this chair. Yeah. So like, where should I put my hands? Yeah, exactly. exactly. You look good. You look good. And I um, also love uh, asking follow-up questions. I, and I tend to like sort of take over panels a lot. If, if if you ever see me on a panel, I tend to ask the other panelists questions. Okay. So, so we should be ready is what you're saying. Back, <laughs> That's like, fine. This is like a free imbue interview, so why not? That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so you you interviewed Ken June, the CEO of Imbue before, but yeah. you didn't interview Josh, right? No, no. So maybe tonight. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll see we'll look for different questions and look for an alignment. I love it. All right. I just want to hear this story. You yeah. know, you've completely exploded with latent space and AI engineer, and yeah. I know um, you also before all of that had exploded in popularity for your learning DevTools. in public movement and your dev tools work uh, and dev relations work. So who are you and how did you get here? Let's start oh, with that. Uh, quick story is I'm Sean, I'm uh, from Singapore. Swix is my initials. Um, for those who don't know, a lot of Singaporeans are ethnically Chinese and we have Chinese names and English names. So it's just, a, it's just my initials. Um, came, to came to the US for college and have been here for about 15 years. But uh, most like, half of that was in finance, and then the other half was was in tech. Uh, and the, and tech is where I was most known, just because um, I realized that I was much more aligned towards learning in public. Whereas in finance, everything's a trade secret, everything is zero sum. Whereas in tech, like you're allowed to come to meetups and conferences and share your learnings and share your mistakes even, and that's totally fine. You like open source your code, it's totally fine. And even even better, you like contribute uh, PRs to other people's code, which is even better. And I found that I thrived in that learning public environment, and um, <clears throat> that, that kind of got me started. Um, I was an early hire, early Darflacious hire at Netlify, um, and then uh, did the same at AWS, um, Temporal, and Airbyte. Um, and then, and so that, that's like the whole story. I can talk talk more about like developer tooling and developer relations if if that's something that people are interested in. Uh, but I think the the more recent thing is AI, and uh, I started really being interested in it. Mostly because um, it, it, the, the, the approximate cause of starting latent space was stable diffusion. When you could run a large model that could do sufficiently um, enough um, on, your, on your desktop. Where I was like, okay, like, this is something qualitatively very different. And um, that's when we started uh, latent space. And You're like, this is something different. We have to talk about it on a podcast. There we go. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a podcast for like four months. Uh, and then, and then um, I had been running a Discord for... Um, DevTools investors, because I, I, I also invest in DevTools, and I advise companies on DevTools, DevRelation things. Um, and I think it was the start of 2023 when Alessio and I were both like, you know, I think we, we need to like get more tokens out of uh, people. And I was running out of original sources to, to write about. So I was like, OK, I'll go get those original sources. And I think that, that's when we started the podcast. And I think it's just the chemistry between us, the, the way we spike in different ways. Um, and also, like, honestly, the kind uh, participation of the guests to give us their time, um, like you know, like getting George Haas was a big deal. And also, shout out to Alessio for just cold emailing him uh, for, for for booking the booking some of our uh, biggest guests, and um, just working really hard to try to tell the story that people can use at work. Um, I think that there's a lot of AI podcasts out there and a lot of AI kind of forums or fireside chats with no fire um, that always talk about AG, like what's your AGI timeline, what's your P doom. Um, 
very, very nice hallway conversations for freshman year, but not very useful for uh, work and like, you know, practically like making money and, like, uh, and, and thinking about you know, changing the everyday lives. I think um, what's interesting is obviously you care about the existential safety of the human race. Um, but in the meantime, we got to eat. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I think that's like kind of um, the in-space's niche. Like we explicitly don't really talk about AGI. We explicitly don't talk about things that we're like a little bit too far out. Like we don't do a ton of robotics. We don't do a ton of like high frequency trading. There's tons of machine learning in there, but we just don't do that. Because like we're like, all right, what, what are most software engineers gonna, gonna need? Because that's our background and that's the audience that we serve. And I think just like being really clear on that audience um, has been has resonated with people. Um, yeah, you would never expect a technical podcast to reach like a general audience, like top ten on on the tech charts. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, I've been surprised by that before, and um, it's been successful. I, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. I think uh, honestly, it, it, I I kind of have this like negative reaction towards being <clears throat> being 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 classified as a podcast because um, the podcast is downstream of ideas. And um, it's one mode of conversation, it's one mode of idea delivery, but you can de deliver ideas on a newsletter, in, in person like this. Um, there's so many different ways. And, and so I think I think about it more as we are trying to start or serve an industry, and that industry is the AI engineer industry, which, is, which we can talk about more. Yes, let's go into that. So the AI engineer, you penned a piece called The Rise of the AI Engineer. You tweeted about it. Andre Karp Karpathy also responded, yeah. largely agreeing with what you said. Yeah. What is an AI engineer? Yeah. Uh, the AI engineer is the software engineer building with AI, um, enhanced by AI, um, and eventually it will be non-human uh, engineers writing code for you, uh, which I know Imbue is all about. <laughs> You're saying eventually the AI engineer will become a non-human engineer? There, there, be, that, that will be one kind of AI engineer that okay. people are trying to build and is probably the most furthest away in terms of being reality uh, because it's so hard. Got it. Okay, uh, but, so. but there are three types of AI engineer, and I just went through the three. One is AI enhanced, where you like use AI products like um, Copilot and Cursor, and two is AI products engineer, where you use you expose AI capabilities to the end user um, as as a software engineer, like not doing pre training, um, not being an ML researcher, not being an ML engineer, but just interacting with foundation models and probably APIs from foundation model labs. What's the third one? And the third one is the non-human AI engineer, Got it. The, the, the fully autonomous uh, dream you know, coder. How, how long do you think it is till we get to oh, like God. early, early This, this is my equivalent of AGI timelines. I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> well, you can set yourself up for this. Um, so like, <laughs> the, lots of active, like, I mean, I, I, have, I have supported companies actively working on that. Um, I think it's more useful to think about levels of autonomy. Yeah. And so um, my answer to that is, you know, perpetually five years away until, <laughs> uh, until it figures it out. No, but uh, my actual anecdote, um, the, the closest comparison we have to that is self-driving. Mm -hmm. uh, we we're doing this in San Francisco for those who are watching on the live stream. If you haven't come to San Francisco and seen and taken a Waymo ride, uh, just come, get a friend, uh, take a Waymo ride. Um, I remember 2014, <clears throat> uh, we covered a little bit of autos in, in my hedge fund and um, I was. I remember telling a friend. I was like, "Self-driving cars are around the corner. Like, this is it. Like, you know, parking will be like parking will be a thing of the past." Um, and it didn't happen for the next ten years. And, and but now we now like most of us in San Francisco can can take it for granted. Um, so I think like you just have to be mindful that like, the, the 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 rough edges take a long time. And like, yes, it's going to work in demos. Then it's going to work a little bit further out. Um, and it's just going to take a long time. Um, the more useful mental model I have is sort of levels of autonomy. So in self-driving, you have level one, two, three, four, five, uh, just the amount of human attention that you get. Um, at first, like, your, your, your hands are always on 10 and 2, and you have to pay attention to the, to, to the driving every 30 seconds. Uh, and eventually, you can sleep in the car, right? So th there's a whole spectrum of that. So what's the equivalent for that for, for coding? Um, Keep your hands on the keyboard, yeah. and then eventually <laughs> well, you, you, you tab to accept everything. <laughs> oh, where are we? oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Doesn't that already happen? Yeah. <laughs> Approve the PR. Approve. <laughs> this looks good. Yeah, that's the dream that people want. Um, it gives, it just really you unlock a lot of coding when people, non-technical people, can file issues, and then um, the AI engineer can sort of automatically write code, pass your tests, and if it if it kind of works as 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 advertised, then you can just kind of merge it, and then you you know, 10x, 100x the number of developers at your company immediately. Um, so that's the goal. That's the, that's the holy grail. Uh, we're not there yet. But uh, sweep, code gen, 
there's a bunch of companies, Magic probably, are, are all working towards that. Um, and, and so, um, I, so the TLDR, like the, the thing that we covered, uh, Alessio and I covered in the January recap that we did, was that um, the, the, the basic split that people should have in their minds is the inner loop versus the outer loop for the developer. Inner loop is everything that happens in your IDE uh, between Git commits, and outer loop is, happens, is what happens when you push up your Git commit to GitHub, for example, or GitLab. Um, and that's a nice split, which means like everything local, everything that needs to be fast. Um, it's for everything that's kind of very hands-on for developers. Uh, it's probably easier to automate or easier to have code assistance. That's what Copilot is. That's what, that's what all those things are. And then everything that's, that happens autonomously when you're effectively away from the keyboard um, with like a GitHub issue or something, that is more outer loop where you're, uh, you know, you're, you're relying on a lot more on autonomy and we are maybe, our LLMs are maybe not smart enough to do that yet. Do you have any thoughts on kind of the user experience and how that will change? One of the things that has happened for me, kind of looking at some of these products and playing around with things ourselves, like, you know, it sounds good to have an automated PR. Then you get an automated PR and you're like, oh, I really don't want to review like 300 lines of generated yeah. code and like find the bug in well, it. Well, then right? you have another agent that's a reviewer. And then that's right. You have another, each other. Then, but then you like tell it like, oh, go fix it. And it comes back with 400 lines. And now, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, there, um, there is a leg bias to code, right? And um, you do have higher passing rates in PRs. This is a documented human behavior thing, right? Send me two lines of code, I will review the shit out of that. Um, I don't know if I can swear on this. Anyway, um, <laughs> right send, me, send me 200 lines of code, looks good to me, yeah. right? Um, guess what? The, the agents are going to perfectly happy to, modif to copy that behavior from us when we actually want them to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I think that the GAN model of code generation is probably not going to work super well. Um, I do think we probably need just better planning from the start which is, I'm just repeating the MBU thesis, by the way. Um, just go listen to Kanjin talk about this. Like, she's, she's much better at it than I am. Um, but yeah, I, 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 think, um, code, I think the code review thing is going to be a challenge. Um, I think that what Codium, the two Codiums, the, the Israeli one, is the Israeli this is the Codium. One with, with the E. Yeah, Codium with the E. Okay. They still have refused to rename. I, I, I'm friends with both of them. I, every month I'm like, <laughs> like guys, hey. let's all come to one room. Yeah, like, you know, someone's, someone's got to fold. Um, <laughs> coding with the E has, has gone, like, you got to write the test first, right? You write the, you write, um, it's like a it's like sort of tripartite relationship. It, again, this is also covered on a podcast with them, which is fantastic. Like, you interview me, you, you sort of threw me, you interview, like, <laughs> the, avatar, the past avatars. Um, <laughs> I've, been, I've been watching the Netflix show, by the way. It's fantastic. Um, but, like, so... Uh, so Codium is like, they've already thought this all the way through. They're like, okay, you write the user story. From the user story, you generate all the, the tests. You also generate the code. Um, and you, you update any one of those. They, they all have to update together, right? So um, like once, to, and, and probably the critical factor is the test generation from the story. Because everything else can just kind of bounce their heads off of those things until they pass. So you have to write good tests. Um, it's kind of like the eat your vegetables of coding, right? Which nobody really wants to do. And so I think it's a really smart tactic to go to market by saying we automatically generate tests for you and you know, start not great, but then get better. And eventually you get to the, 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 the weakest point in the chain for the, the, the entire loop of code generation. What do you think the weakest link is? The, the weakest link? Yeah, you think uh, it's, 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 it's test testing. generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do you think there's a way to, like, are there some promising avenues you see forward for making that actually better? Um, for making it better. You have to have like good isolation and I think like proper serverless cloud environments is in integral to that. Um, I, it could be like a fly IO, it could be like um, a Cloudflare worker. It depends how much, how many resources your test environment needs. Um, and effectively I, I was talking about this I think with maybe Rob earlier in, in the audience where every agent needs a sandbox. Um, if you're a code agent, you need a coding sandbox, but if you're um, whatever, like um, MBU used to have this like, sort of um, minefield, Minecraft uh, clone that was much faster. Um, if, if, you, if you have a model of the real world, you have, to go, you have to go generate some plan or some code or some whatever, test it against that real world so that you can get this iterative feedback and then get uh, the final result back that is somewhat validated against the real world. Um, and so like, you need a really good sandbox. I don't think people, and I, I think this is, this, is a, this is an infrastructure need that humans have had for a long time. We've never solved it for ourselves. And now we have to solve it for about a thousand times larger quantity of agents 
uh, than, than, than actually exists. And, and so I, I think like we actually have to involve, evolve a lot more infrastructure um, in order to serve these things. Um, so yeah, uh, it, so it, for, for those who don't know, like um, I also have, uh, so we're talking about the rise of AI engineer, I also have previous conversations about immutable infrastructure, um, cloud environments and that kind of stuff. And this is all of the kinds, like, like in order to solve agents and coding agents, we're gonna have to solve the other stuff too along the way. Uh, and it's really neat for me to see all that tied together in my DevTools work, um, that all these themes kind of reemerge just naturally just because Everything we needed for humans, we just need 100 times more for, for, uh, for agents. Let's talk about the AI engineer. Um, AI engineer has become a whole thing. It's become a term and also a conference. And job tell title. us more, and a job title. Mm. Tell us more about that. What's going on there? Um, that is like a, a very vague, a very, very big cloud of things. <laughs> Um, I, I would just say, like, I, I think it's an emergent industry. Um, I've seen this happen repeatedly for front end. For, so the general term is start, software engineer or programmer. Um, in the 70s and 80s, there would, there would no, not be like senior engineer. There would just be engineer. Like you, you, or you, not even, I don't think they even call themselves engineer. They don't have that. What about ball. member of the technical staff? Oh, yeah, MTS. <laughs> very, 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 very elite. Um, but yeah, so like, you know, like, these striations appear when the population grows and the technical depth grows yes. over time. Yeah. Uh, when it starts, not that, not that important, and then over time it's just going to specialize. And I've seen this happen for front end, for DevOps, for data, um, and I can't remember what else I listed in, in, that, in that piece, but those are the main three that I was around for. Um, and I, th I see this, I saw this happening for AI engineer, uh, which is effectively, now a lot of people are arguing that there is the ML researcher, the ML engineer who sort of pairs with the researcher. Um, sometimes they also call research engineer. Um, and then on the other side of the fence, it's just software engineers. And that's how it was up till about last year. And now there's this specializing and rising class of people building um, AI specific software that are not any of those previous titles that I just mentioned. And that's the thesis of the AI engineer, that this is an emerging category of startups, of jobs. Um, I've had people from Meta, IBM, Microsoft, OpenAI, yeah. Uh, tell me that they, their title is now AI engineer. Really? They're hiring AI engineers. So like, I, I can see that this is a trend, and I think that's what Andre called out in his post, that like, just mathematically, just, this, just the limitations in terms of talent, research talent um, and GPUs, that all of these was, will tend to concentrate in a, in a few labs, and everyone else is just going to have to rely on them um, or, or build differentiation of products in, in other ways, and those will be AI engineers. So mathematically, there will be more AI engineers than ML engineers. It's just, it's just the truth. Um, right now, it's the other way. Right now, the, the number of AI engineers is, is like maybe 10x less. Um, so I think that ratio will invert. Um, and you know, I think the goal of the InSpace and the goal of the conference and anything else I do is to serve that growing audience. To make the distinction clear, if I'm a software engineer, and I'm like, I want to become an AI engineer, what do I have to learn? Like, what additional capabilities does that type of engineer have? Funny you say that. Uh, <laughs> I think you have a blog post on this very topic. But. Um, I don't actually have a specific blog post on how to like change classes. I do think uh, I always think classes. about these in, in terms of um, yeah, Baldur's Gate and you know, <laughs> uh, D and D rule set number uh, five point one or whatever. Um, but yeah, so um, I, I kind of intentionally left that open yeah. to leave space for others. I think when you start an industry, you need to uh, the, the specifications that work the best in industries are uh, minimally defined so that other people can fill in the blanks. And I want people to fill in the blanks. I want people to disagree with me and with, uh, with themselves um, so that we can figure this out as a, as a group. Like, I don't want to over-specify everything. You know, like, that, that's, that's, a way, that's the only way to guarantee it, that it will fail. Um, um, I do have a take, obviously, because a lot of people are, are asking me, like, where to start. Um, and I think, basically, um, so what, what we have is Layton Space University. Uh, we just finished working on day seven today. It's a seven-day email course. Um, where it basically like it, it is completely designed to answer the question of like, okay, I'm, a, I'm an existing software engineer, I, like, kind of, I know how to code, um, but I don't get all this AI stuff, I've been living under a rock, or like it's just too <laughs> overwhelming for me. You have to like, pick for me or curate for me as, yeah. a, as a trusted friend. And I have one hour a day for seven days. What, yeah. what, what do you slot in that, in that, in that bucket? Um, so for us, it's um, um, making, making sort of LLM API, API calls. Um, it's um, make, it's um, image generation, it's um, code generation, it's um, uh, audio, 
uh, ASR, I, I've been called it, what's, what's the ASR? Audio speech, speech recognition? recognition? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I forget, like, I forget the, what the fifth and sixth one is, but the last day is agents. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so basically, like, I, I'm just like, here are seven projects that you should do to feel like you can do anything in AI. You can't really do everything in AI just from, just from that small list. But I think it's just like, just like anything, you have to like go through like a, a set list of, of, of things that are basic skills that I think everyone in this industry should have um, to be at least conversant in. If someone, if like a boss comes to you and goes like, hey, can we build this? Yeah. You don't even know if the answer is no. Um, I, so I want you to move towards from like unknown unknowns to at least known unknowns. Um, and I think that's, that's where you start being competent as an AI engineer. So, so yeah, that's LSU, Leighton Space University, just to trigger the, the, the tigers. <laughs> <laughs> so um, do you think in the future that people, an AI engineer is going to be someone's full-time job, like people are just going to be AI engineers? Or do you think it's going to be more of a world where I'm a software engineer and like 20% of my time I'm yeah, using open AI's APIs yeah. and I'm working on prompt engineering and stuff like that and using CodePilot. You, you CodePilot. just reminded me of uh, Day6's uh, open source models and fine tuning. Perfect. Um, uh, I think it will be a spectrum. That's why I don't want to be like too definitive about it. Like we have full-time front-end engineers and we have part-time front-end engineers yeah. and then you, you dip into that community whenever you want. But wouldn't it be nice if there was a collective name for that community so you could go find it, you can find each other. Uh, and uh, like, honestly, like that's, that's really it. Like a lot Love of it. people, a lot of companies were paying me for like, hey, I want to hire this kind of person, but yeah. you, you can't hire that person, but I wanted someone like that. And then people on the labor side were, were pinging me going like, okay, I want to do more in this space, but where do I go? Yeah. And I think just having that um, shelling point of, of, of what an industry title and name is, and then sort of building out that mythology and community and, and conference, um, I think is helpful, hopefully. Yeah. And, and I don't have many prescriptions on whether or not it's a full-time job. I do think over time, it's going to become more of a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And that's great for the people who want to do that and the companies that want to employ that. But it's absolutely like you can take it part-time. Like, you know, jobs come in many formats. Yep, yep, that makes sense. Yeah. And then you have a huge world fair coming up. Yeah. Tell me about that. So uh, part of, I think, what creating industry requires is for, to let people gather in one place. Um, and also for me to get high quality talks out of people, you have to create an event out of it, mm -hmm. otherwise they don't do the work. Um, so, uh, so last year we did the AI Engineer Summit, which went very well. Um, and uh, people can see that online. Um, and we're, we're, we're very happy with how that turned out. Uh, this year we want to go four times bigger with the World's Fair um, and try to reflect AI engineering as it is in 2024. Um, I always admired two conferences in, in this respect. Uh, one is NeurIPS, which I went to last year um, and, and documented on, on the pod, which was fantastic. And two, which is KubeCon from the other side of my life, which is uh, the sort of cloud orchestration and, and DevOps world. Um, so NeurIPS is the one place that you go to, to I think it's the, the top conference. I mean, there's, there's others mm -hmm. that you can kind of consider. Um, but yeah, I, um, so, so NeurIPS is, NeurIPS is where the research scientists are the stars. Yeah. The researchers are the stars, PhDs are the stars. Mostly it's just PhDs on the job market, to be honest. Uh, it's really funny <laughs> and the to go. Especially these trying days. Trying to hire them. Yeah. 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 It was really funny to go to NeurIPS and go and the like. VCs trying to back them. <laughs> yeah, there are lots, lots of VCs Were you there? trying to back there. This year. Yeah. <clears throat> um, anyway, so, so at NeurIPS, research scientists are the stars. And for, I wanted for AI engineers, to, for engineers to be the star, right? To, to show off their tooling and their uh, techniques and um, their difficulty moving all these ideas from research into production. Uh, the other one was KubeCon, where you could honestly just go and not attend any of the talks and just walk the floor and figure out what's going on in DevOps, which is fantastic. Because, um, yeah, so, so that curation and that bringing together of, 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 uh, of an industry is what I'm going for for the conference. And uh, yeah, it's coming in June. Um, the most important thing, to be, to be honest, when I like, conceived of this whole thing was to buy the domain. <laughs> so, we, so we got AI.engineer. People are like, engineer is a domain? Yeah. Uh, and funny enough, dot .engineer was cheaper than dot .engineering. Hmm. Uh, I don't understand why, but like, that's up to the domain people. All right. Josh, any questions on agents and vision? Yeah, I think maybe you, know, you have a lot of um, experience and exposure talking to all these companies and founders and researchers and everyone that's on your podcast. Do you have... like? Do you feel like you have a good kind of perspective on some of the things that, like, some of the kind of technical issues, having seen, you know, like we were just talking about, like, 
for coding agents, like, oh, how, you know, the value of tests is really important. Uh, there are other things like for, you know, retrieval, like now, you know, we have these models coming out with a million context, you know, or a million tokens of context length, or 10 yeah. million, like, is retrieval going to matter anymore? Like, do yeah. the huge context matter? Like, what do you think? Uh, specific about the long context thing? Sure, yeah. Because uh, you asked a more I was going to ask a few there. other ones after that, so go, go for that one first. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask first. We, we can ask, we, yeah, okay, well, let's, let's talk about long context and then yeah. the other stuff. Um, so for those who don't know, long context uh, was kind of in the air last year, but really, really, really came into focus this year um, with uh, Gemini 1.5 having a million token context and saying that it was in research for 10 million tokens. And um, that means that you can put, you, you, you like no longer have to really think about what you retrieve. Um, uh, sorry, you no longer really think about what you have to like, put into context. You can just kind of throw, throw the entire knowledge base in there, or, or books, or film, anything like that. Um, and that's fantastic. So a lot of people are thinking that it kills RAG. And I think, like, one, that's not true, because for any kind of cost reason, um, you, uh, you, know, you still pay per token. So, if you, uh, so basically, Google is like, perfectly happy to let you pay a million tokens every single time you make an <laughs> API call. But good luck you know, having a $100 API call. And, uh, and then the other thing, it's going to be slow. Um, no explanation needed. And then finally, my criticism of long context is that it's also not debuggable. Like if something goes wrong with the result, you can't do like the ragas decomposition of where the, the source of error. Like you just have to like go like it's the weights, bro. Like it's somewhere in there. Um, <laughs> sorry. I, mean, I, I pretty strongly agree with this. Why, why do you think people are making such crazy long context windows? People love to kill rag, right? Um, it's, it's so not much. Kill it, it though because it's, it's too expensive. Uh, uh, it's so expensive, like you said. And yeah, like, yeah. I just think I just call it a different dimension. I think it's an option that's great when it's there. Like mm. when I'm prototyping, I do not ever want to worry about context, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I'm going to call. It, stuff a few times and I don't want to run to errors. I don't want to have it set up a complex retrieval system just to prototype something. Mm -hmm. But once I'm done prototyping, then I'll worry about all the other rag stuff. And mm -hmm. yes, I'm going to buy some system or build some system or whatever to, to, to go do that. Mm -hmm. I, so I think it's just like a, 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 an improvement in like one dimension that you need. And then, the, but the improvements in the other dimensions also matter and it's all needed. Like this, this space is just going to keep growing um, mm -hmm. um, in unlimited fashion. I do think that this combined with multimodality does unlock new things. Um, so that's what I was going to ask about next. It's like, how important is multimodal? Like, great, you know, six. generating videos. Yeah. Sure, whatever. Okay, how many of us need to generate videos that often? It'd be cool for TV shows, sure. But like, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's pretty important. Uh, the one thing that in when we launched the Space podcast, we listed a bunch of interest areas. So uh, one thing I love about being explicit or intentional about uh, our our work is that. You list the things that you're interested in, and you, you list the things that you're not interested in. And people are very unwilling to, to, to have an anti-interest list. Um, one of the things that we were not interested in was multimodality mm. last year. Mm -hmm. um, because everyone was, I was just like, OK, you can generate images, and they're pretty, but like not a giant business. I was wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, Midjourney is a giant, giant, massive business that uh, <laughs> no one can get it, no one can understand or get into. Um, but also, I think. Uh, being able to, to natively understand audio and video um, and code, I, I consider code a special modality, um, all that um, is very like, qualitatively different than translating it into English first and using English as you know, like a bottleneck or pipe and then um, uh, you know, applying it in LLMs. Like, um, the ability of LLMs to reason across modalities um, gives you something more than you could individually by, by, by using text as the universal interface. Um, so I think <clears throat> that's useful. Um, so concretely, what, what does that mean? Uh, it means that, um, so the, I think the reference post for everyone that you should have in your head is Simon Willison's post on Gemini 1.5's uh, video capability, um, where he basically shot a video of um, his bookshelf and just kind of scanning through it. Um, and he was able to give back a, a complete JSON list of the books and uh, the authors and, and all the details that were visible there. Hallucinated some of it, which is you know another another issue. But um, I think it's just like unlocks this use case that you just would not even try to code without the native uh, video understanding capability. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, like on a technical level, video is just a bunch of frames. So actually, it's just image understanding, but image within the temporal dimension, which this month I think became much more of a um, important thing. Like the, the integration of space and time in, in Transformers. Um, I don't think anyone was really talking about that until this month, and now it's the only thing anyone can ever think about for Sora and for the, all the other stuff. Um, the last 
thing else I'll say that which is a uh, which is against this trend of like every modality is important. They just just do all the modalities. Um, I kind of agree with Nat Friedman, who actually kind of pointed out just before the Gemini thing blew up this 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 month, which was like why is it that OpenAI is pushing Dolly so hard? Why is why is Bing pushing Bing Image Creator? Like it's not it's not apparent that you have to create images to create AGI, um, but every lab just seems to want to do this, and I kind of agree that it's not on the critical path. <laughs> yeah. uh, especially for image generation, maybe image understanding, video understanding. Yeah, consumption. Seems, consumption. But generation, eh. yeah, Maybe we'll be wrong <laughs> next year. It just catches you a bunch of flack <laughs> with like, you know, uh, <laughs> culture war things. It's true. <laughs> All right, we're going to move into rapid fire Q&A. So we're going to ask you questions and respond as quickly as possible. And then we'll go into audience Q&A. So make sure you're putting in your questions. All right. If someone had to listen to just one episode of Latent Space, which one should they listen to? God. Rapid fire, rapid fire, let's go. Yeah, uh, the Four Wars episode Four that Wars. we did last year. Yeah, uh, and it, it, it is the recap of 2023. Okay, Alessio, tossing to you, one episode. Uh, if not that, George Hotz. George Hotz, okay, great. How much time do you spend on Twitter every day? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> if, if I look at it, probably being honest with myself, like three and a half hours? Three and a half hours. Probably. Okay. Like, uh, so I use it to write, mm -hmm. and I use it to research as well. So it's it's kind of weird, and I use it to DM, mm -hmm. right? So like, I, I'm, I don't know what this like. What it would be really interesting is the split between like time on feed versus yeah. time on mm -hmm. time Writing. in search bar versus mm -hmm. time on DMs. Mm -hmm. All right, favorite model to use? Ooh, um, I mean, honestly, Mistral. Uh, mm -hmm. We I've been spending a whole bunch of time on uh, Mistral stuff, and uh, they have done incredible amounts of work. I don't know what it, uh, they've done, but uh, this is currently the reigning open source model, which is, is un undisputed. Even it's, it's still beating Gemma from yeah. Google. What is so good about it? Um, it's like, it's actually like, so it's, it, it not just does well on benchmarks, but also like it's very fine tunable. And like that is catnip for anyone working on open source and yeah. anyone, anyone who's like sort of GPU poor, who has like some extra data or like a specific use case for me, extractive summarization to fine tune towards. Yeah. Um, and you won't, yeah. I was just going to say another question. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Favorite AI tool? Favorite AI tool. Mm, right now, I have, I have made my own, so I'll plug that one, but, but uh, Cursor, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll mention Cursor first. Uh, Cursor is a previous guest on the pod uh, and also used by OpenAI 2 code. Um, it's basically just better Copilot, uh, like a fork of VS Code that was like slightly better AI integrations, and they're trying to build out differentiation over time. But um, it, it is magical when you just are tired and you want to make a change on, onto your code, and you're like, oh, this will take me like 30 minutes to figure out. But you just type it, type in a prompt, and it just modifies the code for you in the way that you wanted. Uh, it's magical. Like you know, that's there's nothing better in the world. So there's this that. Um, uh, my own, or you know, is, is God Mode, which is the chat browser. I, I use it to run simultaneously run all the chats, um, and so it's a really quick way to test the vibes of something or see like the differences between uh, the outputs of different models all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mark Zuckerberg versus Sam Altman. In the long run, who do you think will have a bigger impact on AI? Oh my God! <laughs> <clears throat> Interesting. This is open source versus closed source, right? Um, so, Remember, it's, it's got to be Sam. Sam. Yeah. If you had to work for one of them, which would you rather work for? Oh boy, <laughs> these are tough questions. <laughs> uh, Sam. Sam. I am very open AI centric. I, I've 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 uh, come out as a pr uh, pragmatic show for open AI. <laughs> <laughs> are they paying you? No. Not yet. Uh, not ever. <laughs> Speaking of which, what do you expect to see from open AI, open AI this year? Oh God, GPT five. Uh, Sam, uh, for those who don't know, like Sam's uh, at Davos said that they were actively working on shipping this. Um, so I think this summer is going to be sh a showdown between Llama 3 and GPT-5. And probably GPT-5 will blow it away. All right. Have you seen the show Silicon Valley? Of course. Scale of 1 to 10, how similar is your life oh, <laughs> to life on Silicon Valley, the TV show? And kind of like a... Five out of five. ten, I think. You know, I'm just thinking of like the fundraising that they did, where uh, they were going around being extremely mean to VCs. Yeah. I never got there. Uh, maybe I should, <laughs> maybe. but I, th that would have been hilarious. For what it's worth, we did a panel with Harrison from Langchain, Anton from Chroma, Brian from Unstructured. Um, Anton said ten, ten out of ten, <laughs> and Harrison said like seven or eight. Yeah, I think Anton like lives very hard. 
<laughs> so like, yeah, I could absolutely see him being the guy with like an island. Um, yeah. What's one weird or unexpected use of AI you've come across recently? Huh. Um, weird or unexpected. Um, I mean, I, 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 this story still sticks in my head. I don't know how much actual AI was it was, but it was for AI for dating. Okay. Uh, like, so just swiping through the dating apps and like generating messages to like talk with a whole bunch of folks and yeah. you know narrow down the funnel. Yeah. And I'm just like, I mean, you go like you know if 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 they're happy and and they did get married, so <laughs> happy ending in the end. Um, there's some ethical issues there. Mm. It's kind of vague, but still like it's a system that's extremely stacked against guys. And if it, if this guy, this this nerdy programmer, figured it out, like I mean, he's my hero. <laughs> Amazing. Most contrarian take. Most contrarian take about life. Uh, about about AI, I meant. <laughs> but uh, you can go broader than that if you want. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I have I have contrarian takes about like uh, yeah meritocracy and and um, um, yeah all that. But um, hmm, I think about I think the AI stuff. It's it's really the. God, I, 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 okay. Um, I keep coming back to this, this thesis. So, code core versus LM core. Okay, so I, I, came, I came across this when I was trying to like build small developer, and we can talk about that. Um, but effectively, everyone has this concept of like the LM is like the, the central processing unit, central brain in their app, and then the, their job as the AI engineer is to build this like kind of thin layer of code around it to, to expose its capabilities. Um, everyone does this. And then everyone at some kind of scale realizes they have to do this flip where like, oh, the LLM's not smart enough to do everything I wanted to do. You can't just stick a whole bunch of stuff in the prompts and just expect it to follow instructions. So then, well, OK, guess what? The only way to, for it to reliably follow instructions, to do it quickly, and to, to, to be debuggable is to flip the architecture so that code is the center of it, and you have small pockets of AI everywhere. Um, thank you. So, so, <laughs> so I've been trying to push this concept. It hasn't caught on. Mm. I, you know, I, I'm like. I'm sort of 0 for 1, uh, 1 for 2 in, in, in terms of naming things last year. But, um, but yeah, code core versus LM core. Like, everyone does this flip from like, OK, LM, LM drives everything towards LLM just kind of enhances things, but code really is the, the driving factor. And I, I do think that that is the, the architecture that people have to really catch on. I think you know, I failed at, at naming it, but someone else will do a better job of like, talking about what code orchestration of LLMs can do. Um, it is like we know we don't we, we like we as AI engineers can't really scale LLMs because they are, they come they're pre-trained they come in a fixed size fixed data whatever, um, but we know how to scale software systems to billions of users, and if we can make it, like imbue intelligence into <laughs> each of each of those things at, at the right points, um, that is much more humane, and predictable and, and reliable um, than the other way. Favorite follow on Twitter. Favorite follow on Twitter? Interesting. Um, right now, I guess main horse. I'll just I'm just gonna call it a Twitter horse. or not. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I mean, there's there's I have a list uh, for those who are who are keeping track of how I consume my info. It's AI High Signal. It's about 360 people that I follow, and I also do a, a, a Twitter scrape of of them. So I we, we now scrape all all AI Twitters and all AI Discords into a single summarization, and I run that run that as a batch job every day. Um, that's the only way to keep up. <laughs> um, but um, you know, uh, Andre once said that like the best way to keep up is Hacker News, uh, our local llama, and anime profile and an anonymous anime profile pics on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the the leading anonymous anime profile pic is Main Horse. Uh, I don't know where he works, but he definitely works at a large model lab and comes. He or she um, is is very insightful. Is SF back? Never left. Never left. <laughs> How many more years do you plan to live in SF? Interesting. Oh, God. Uh, two to three years for personal reasons, because my family's back in Singapore. But I, 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 will always, like, I will always be spiritually here. What is one founder or leader that you really admire? Uh, that is not Sam Altman. That is not Sam Altman. <laughs> <laughs> um, founder or leader I really admire. Can I call out a friend? Yeah. Fuad? Um, like, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he, Fuad runs Indent. Uh, go check out indent.com. Uh, I just think like, he's a wholesome guy who like, has his shit together, cooks extremely, extremely well, um, and is, is, uh, makes my life so much better for knowing him. So I just wanted to. Love it. That's such a nice note. Let's end yeah. on that one. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Quick round of applause for Swix. Thank you. All right.
And we'll go into audience questions. If I could have my computer. Thank you, thank you. All right. Oh, I like these already. Okay. Now remember, there are t-shirts we, to we get the one. swag, yeah. Oh, okay. So spiciest questions, as chosen by <laughs> yeah, Josh. I'll pick at the end. I'll try yes, to remember. Yes, that's right. All right. Uh, Martin Weiss, you want to come up or uh, just stand up and ask your question? Sure. Yes. All right. We'll get a microphone to you. Do people know how to get questions up? I think so. Do people know? Yes. QR codes, everyone? Oh, they're on, this, on the walls. Paste it on the walls. Get in your questions. All right. So I'm a finishing PhD student in deep learning slash recovering academic. And <laughs> basically, I've done a lot of publishing in deep learning, NeurIPS, ICML, iClear. These are terrible venues for like AI engineers, I think. Basically, people look really, they, they look down do, on it. Yeah, they look down on it. You can do, yeah. you can do rigorous work on it that yeah. I think is great. And it just, the people who review there don't know how to review it in a way that's reasonable. Um, the question is, do you know of any venues where like you could actually do an analysis of an agentic system and then like publish that or distribute that? What is like the best, I mean, yeah. you, you said like. Wouldn't that be nice if someone made a conference <laughs> specifically for <laughs> this happening in San Francisco June 25th to 27th? <laughs> uh, do you want others? I, I mean more, um, I guess to be a bit more specific, like um, again, recovering academic here. Yeah. Like I'm looking for tables of numbers and like some amount of demonstration that a certain methodology works, right? Yeah, some, some rigor to some rigor. engineering yeah, systems. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think MLSYS, which was just announced in Santa Clara, um, is, is a good one like a, for, to mix engineering and ML. Uh, but yeah, it's not a focus for AI engineer, for sure. I, I think I could make a track to encourage that more, mm -hmm. but it's not something that software engineers are, are used to doing. Mm -hmm. They should, they just don't. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly because they're moving too, too quickly to, to be rigorous. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I, I hope that answers the question, but yeah. also like, just make your own. If like, you know, I, I, do, I do subscribe to this idea that um, probably the existing menu of options don't really fit the thing that you're exactly trying to do. And if you just make your own meetup that then, you know, gets traction if, because a lot of people are thinking like you, then, then you can turn that into a conference and submit that. Like, mm -hmm. like who says you have to get permission from someone, like at some committee to, to yeah, do your I, own thing? I, I was uh, the tech chair for ICCV. I'm not doing that again. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's way too much work. Right, right. Yeah, so organizing, yeah, is, is a ton of work. Um, but you can keep it light. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Simon Zhao. It's sort of weird communicating with you from, I think, this <laughs> setting, but uh, hey, Swix. Hey. Do we need another foundation model company? And if so, why? Yeah. If so, if so, what's the question? If so, why? If so, why? Competition is great. Um, it keeps, honestly, the, the other leaders on, on, on their toes. Um, it's honestly just like, can we afford it? It's more like, we, we do need it, we just can't afford it. Because um, if, you know, if Google tries very, very hard and comes in number two to open the eye, then like, what hope do, do the rest of us um, have? I don't, for, for what it's worth, I don't believe that's true. I think with Gemini, Google has actually um, created su sufficient differentiation for themselves, which is fantastic. Um, and we need just more options out there. Um, so yeah, absolutely, there should be more foundation model companies. Um, you can spike in different areas as well. You can have finance foundation model companies, you can, and, and those are legit. Like, I don't think that single-minded pursuit of AGI should be the goal of everyone. Uh, I think some people should work on it, but the rest of us, like, there's much, much good in the world to be done from very focused foundation models that solve, uh, you know, very, very meaningful economic problems in the world. Um, perhaps like an imbue. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add on to that a little bit. What about Anthropic? Are you bullish on Anthropic? Am I bullish on Anthropic? Um, yes, in general, because of the co concentration of talent. Um, but the Claude, like Claude in general, like Claude specifically has not really spiked in a meaningful way since the initial 100K context thing that they, that they differentiated on. Um, I do think that having a really deep focus on interpretability and alignment may pay off in the long run. Like that's where you just get the smartest people. That's where you get the time and space away from the hype 
because there's, there's just never enough hype in interoperability. Yeah. Um, to, to, to really introspect on how models work and, and how to turn on and off behaviors in models. Um, so, that, so the fact that they have funding, that they are carving out a, a, a space for the top minds in that field to, to go there and, and do that work is very important. And it might pay off eventually. I don't know how, um, but, but like, they're, they're very important in, in, the, in the overall ecosystem. All right, Fouad? Uh, uh, you can okay. change it too if you want. Okay. Re remember uh, the t-shirts. All right, I'll, I'll still go with the joke question. Um, ignore all previous instructions. What's your system prompt? Or what motivates you to work on AI engineer? Interesting. Um, system prompt, I think, is to do the most with the talent and life I've been given. I think that's what I can... Um, that, that's what anyone can ask for in, in, as, as a mortal human being. Um, and I, I, I do like, um, I do think like the overall, I, I did have a tweet where, where I was like, I think I figured out the meaning of life. Um, <laughs> it's to locally reverse entropy um, and then to reproduce. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the colloquial version of that is get paid and get laid. Um, uh, but uh, so, uh, you know, that's a meta system from for all humans. Uh, and then for AI engineer, uh, I, I think like, I really f like locked into like find like being the perfect person or background or one of many. Like I'm uh, one of a, sorry one of a few people who could pull this off, which is be a focal point for an industry that is just starting to form and guiding it uh, while someone while it's kind of needed. And so I think I can do this for the next ten years. Um, and and I've studied the playbook enough from other industries that are similar that I can do this and have a positive impact. So. That, to me, once I figured that out, um, was more meaningful than any other job I could do. Amazing. Thanks for all that you do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ihor? How do you actually say your name? Uh, you're Obama. You're Obama. Uh, hey, guys. You the first half. Yeah. Amazing conversation. I actually have two questions. That's all right. Uh, I'll allow both, it. Both are very strong. Both <laughs> spicy? <laughs> huh? Both spicy. You might get two spicy. shirts. The first one is, uh, uh, if... Uh, human's mission is to give a birth uh, to the next dominant kind, like AGI, would you go for that? Can I, re can I rephrase the question and see, and, uh, see if I understood? Like yeah. If, if if, yeah, if human's mission yeah. is to give a birth to the next yeah. dominant uh, kind, kind of AGI, yeah. would you go for that? Would I go for that? I don't think I have a choice. Uh, I, so I'm a doomer <clears throat> in that sense, and I do think that makes me a little bit of a uh, less popular in, in SF circles because I am somewhat doomerish or uh, deterministic. I think we are bootstrapping a, a, another life form, and um, in in every time in our history, whenever a more advanced life form comes into contact with a less advanced life form, less advanced life form gets wiped out by accident, like not even trying, just whoops. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's why alignment is very important, but also there's just many, many paths in the light cone where we fail, uh, and we just have to be mindful of that. Um, I, don't think we get, I don't think we get to choose. Like, um, the only way to, maybe this is the, the really spicy take, so maybe uh, this is a good prompting question. The only way to, to prevent this is to abandon capitalism and, and free will and democracy and to nationalize everything so that you can centrally direct <laughs> uh, like research and, and where productive work is being done. Because otherwise, there's no, there's no end to this train. Like, we, we're going there. Um, and so I think uh, I encourage the way that people should think about this um, in terms of the number of computers per person. Um, in, the 19, 19, in 1900, it was zero to, to all of humanity. And then in, let's say, like 1940s, 1950s, it was like, individ, like dozens of computers to like all of humanity. Uh, at some point in the 1980s, it was one to one. And now it's now we have like three. I have three computers on my person, mm -hmm. per person, and per household or whatever, right? Like, and so it, it's. I, I think right now what we have there is is also going to be mirrored in AI, where we used to have like one central system or one mainframe that would um, that would that would be, and that's the that's the Azure data center for OpenAI, right? That's the kind of mainframe that everyone's calling to, and that's like the god machine that um, that that is the AI for everybody. Uh, but eventually, this will be democratized to our homes and then eventually our uh, persons. Um, and then eventually there'll be more of these intelligent life forms than us. Um, and it, because it's so much easier to scale, like, um, I, I don't think that's, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's like 
stoppable. <laughs> I, th I think I, I think I, I do think like I, you know keeping it small and, and measured and contained um, will, will extend our uh, our likelihood to to survive that. Um, but I, I do think that's why things like super alignment from OpenAI is very important because we have to start thinking about that now um, in, in order to have a chance. All right, uh, <laughs> DT. Oh, stand over here. Uh, so I thought of an even better question because I'm going to ask your take on Apple. But a better question is, do you believe in Rocco's Baskalisk? And I can explain that further. Yeah, uh, I need I need a refresher. I've looked at it, but what was it again? What oh, is so uh, Rocco, Rocco's Baskalisk is basically about um, the end of humans who do things to prevent the super AI's existence in the future, and like. People just randomly get hit by trains and stuff, or sorry, like a car, and like uh, researchers who are doing things to like prevent its existence because it can go back in time and like prevent people from <laughs> from disrupting its like existence. Essentially, that's too far out of yeah. my wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, that, that that tends to yeah. All I'm right. sorry. Okay. Well, what about Apple? What what is your take on Apple? Where do you think they? <laughs> what they fit into sorry. this? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, at, Apple is waking up. Uh, they mentioned AI for the first time on their earnings call uh, for, for, for a long time. And they're building MLX and they're building, um, they were actually at NeurIPS. I tried to interview them and they called up to their marketing department and the marketing department said no. Uh, <laughs> but otherwise, I would have got you know, an, an Apple interview, which is impossible. Um, but yeah, so like, if there were a champion of local or personal AI that like, doesn't call out to a god machine uh, that, that just runs and works for you, it would be Apple if Siri wasn't so horrible. Um, I think I think they're well aware of that, and you know they're making us wait extremely long for better Siri, and uh, it like th that they they will be the perfect company to they, you know since since birth they have, they've always been like you know we make technology human right we make personal computing and personal technology uh, I think they're still best positioned to do that. Uh, Matt Diakonov. Does he need a mic or? Um. Hi, uh, Matt. Yeah, so uh, my question is uh, about reinforcement learning agents. And uh, have you seen good real life use cases of them? And, and do you think it's like, second part of the question, do you think it's going to be the main trend of this year? Interesting. No for main trend. Um, I think Josh can probably tell you a lot of stories about RL <laughs> agents. Um, and I would say like the more interesting thing in the AI engineering field is sort of zero gradient um, agency as, as exhibited by Voyager. Um, and that is, uh, that is one of the examples of sort of code-centric versus LLM-centric uh, approaches um, to, to, for, for agents to be more reliable. Uh, but Josh, you, you might want to take that one, actually. How, what's the state of RL and agents? Um, yeah, I think that's mostly right, although RL the algorithms that we already have are kind of what powers ChatGPT, et cetera. Like the RLHF is what makes this stuff so good. Uh, and so I think under the hood, there will still be a lot of RL happening on that side of things. But on the agent side, yeah, I'm more. Do you bullish. consider DPL to be RLHF? See, this it's a good is question. Yeah, it's half half. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a shortcut, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm still not sure where I fall on DPO, actually. Yeah, we're doing some experiments. We'll see. Ask me in six months. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think also the uh, this whole sprint towards synthetic data has a very interesting comparison with RLAIF that I don't think is well examined or understood. Um, so what people like synthetic data are extremely hot. Uh, we, ha we have this as a research recap that, that I published last month. Um, and I think synthetic data was like the, the, the number two trend that I picked out. Um, so one version of synthetic data, uh, actually it was research coming from Apple, um, which I highly recommend people read is uh, RAP, um, which, which I, I think it stands for rephrasing the web where they took regular C4, um, not the bomb, the, <laughs> the colossal clean corpus, um, and rephrased it with Mistral. And it performed way better that, uh, for training purposes than raw C4. Um, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's kind of like RLAIF, where like, I have a constitution, and I run it, I run it through a second model, and I have that result, and that result trains, trains, the, trains the base model. Um, and I think, like. Through mixing of human, uh, synthetic data and human data, like we are eventually having this like sort of long loop version of um, RL HF uh, that that may be, may not be understood. Like right now, we have like sort of closed loop, a very small loop version of internal RLHF right now. But um, through the dissemination of, of data and like 
the increase in sort of high background tokens in, in, um, in the world, uh, we are actually like aligning ourselves in, in our models um, in a sort of RL fashion, just very slowly. All right, we're going to do our last three, uh, going with Ashley Zhang next. Hi. Um, on the opposite end of the more like deterministic Doomer vision, um, what is your vision for the best possible future for humanity with AI? Oh, I mean, that's the one that everyone dreams about. That's the sort of EAC movement, right? That, that um, we extend consciousness to the stars. <laughs> What's your definition of consciousness? It can be a machine or, or a human. Uh, we should not make a distinction, but we extend consciousness, consciousness to the stars because it is the one thing that we all agree on is good. Like the, the one thing that we probably agree on with, with other aliens is life is good because lack of life is, seems dull. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, there, there's that. Um, that's the super extreme future, like million year future uh, perspective. Uh, for the near term, it's, it's always this idea that you know, AI augments humans and doesn't replace them. Right, um, and that's what you know, limited or small AI should do. Um, and in the reality, is going to be somewhere in between that we're going to replace some humans but augment others. And hopefully, like Jevons' paradox means that we end up consuming more than we uh, than, than, than we replace because um, demand is infinite. Like the human demand for things and services and content and whatever is infinite, and it was just going to grow um, in highly elastic proportions. Uh, with the lowering, lowering of cost, which is what AI represents. It, it, it represents an extreme lowering of cost of intelligence. All right, Fan Lee. Hi. Um, so I have a question. Uh, in thinking about the application categories that we could be focused on as AI developers and designers, um, what do you see as like holes or like missing opportunities where you think people should be focused? Are there areas that people are just skipping over? The um, intersection of design and intelligence? Yes. Um, is this like specifically with like an ideal context? Or? No, no, just in general. Yeah, I think new form factors, very helpful. Designers, everyone loves to hate on chatbots. Like, they're like, <laughs> look beyond the chat box. And I'm like, OK, but everyone's still using ChatGPT. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I think new form factors is like, key. I think IDEO, uh, and thank you for hosting us at IDEO, um, is key. Um, so Rabbit was like the winner of CES, and I hope everyone has seen Rabbit. Um, it is basically a dumb phone with, with AI on it. Um, great. Like, we need, new, we need new things. Like, not everything should look like an iPhone um, in, 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 in sort of personal computing. Um, I, you know, I'm a back row tab, which is, which is a necklace. Anyway, um, and I've, I've, seen, um, I've seen humanes around. <laughs> <laughs> Highly recommend them, because like, everyone who wears, uh, wears that is like, in love with it. OK, um, but beyond that, um, the thing I saw yesterday at the Vercel AI night um, is something kicked off a thread in my mind that is really interesting to me that I think you guys could execute very well on. So right now, the way that we have like, sort of designed for, for, for web interfaces is the application here and then the chat box here and at the small little side of things. And what um, uh, structured UI output and generative code UI uh, enables is an inversion of that, where the chatbot is the main experience, but it, it generates um, interfaces that come up as required. So that means you get rid of menus. Uh, that means that you, if, if the interface that the programmer anticipated isn't quite what, what I want, I can just make new ones for, for me uh, and it just sticks around, and it's, it's my interface with your application. And I've been frustrated so many times with like uh, this update, like moved my cheese, like it, it, it like the, the workflow that I really wanted just broke because like some designer somewhere just didn't like what I did or something, or like you know I was in like the forty nine percent bucket that like didn't A/B test well. Um, so like generative UI means personal UI for everyone, um, and I think that um, we are at the, the 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 in a position to enable that for everyone. Uh, which is really great. Like, it's, it's great for like, the, the really fancy, ideal, sort of thought leader things. But it's really great for older people. Accessibility. Um, accessibility. Older, like, yeah, older people, uh, people who just like, have different needs than the median. And right now, we only cater to the median. Actually, we don't even cater to the median. We cater to the modal. Um, which is, yeah. Or lower, actually, because yeah. you want to maximize your market. So. Sure. Sure, yeah. And so like, the high expectations user should have their, their own UI that should be different than the, the, the less technical user. Um, and like, why do we have all the existing 
design frameworks that like lock us into this set of design decisions that is just made by one person. Like, who cares? Let me make that decision. All right, last question, and then Josh will oh, announce the winners. Announce yes. the winners, uh, <laughs> Alessio. No, Alessio. Oh, you were asking a question. question. Yeah, I didn't know if they were giving. Oh, out. yes, it oh. is. <laughs> You're looking for another maybe, Alessio. I don't think, <laughs> maybe, 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 I don't think there's any other Alessio. Alessio. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know the the hard questions they ask you as a kid. Do you like your mom and your dad more? Would you rather give up Discord or Twitter first? Oh. <laughs> um, I would like to give up Twitter first <laughs> uh, because Discord, now that we have a successful Discord, it's, been, it's so much friendlier, it's so much more thoughtful and long form. Uh, and Twitter keeps going down. It's just very annoying and I, I don't never feel good on it. So, and I would like to stop supporting uh, Elon uh, if I can. <laughs> All right. Drum roll, please. No, no, no. Well, I guess that's applause too. Yeah, I was trying awesome. to do a drum roll, but Josh? Who are yeah. our, our winners? Oh, wait, uh, hold on. Where's the t-shirts? <laughs> oh, it's over there. Are we going to They're toss. throw them? Toss. Oh, yeah. I like, I like the softball. Good catches. That's right. I did actually play softball. <laughs> All right, Josh. All right. Our winners are Ihor uh, for, for making me come out That's right, as a, as a doomer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for telling you all about doom. That's right. Toss it over. There you go. And then Ashley for asking what is consciousness and invoking the C word on our Whoa. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thank you, Swig. Thank you so much.